Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another installment of the UCLA Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Speaker Series. I'm Clark Barrett, uh, the director of the Center for Behavior, Evolution, and Culture, and also the organizer of the Speaker Series this year. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all. Um, before I introduce this week's guest, I would like to just do a brief preview of um, our talk for next week. Next week's, talks, next week's talk will be Nadia Vasilyeva, who is a postdoc in the Department of Anthropology at UCLA this year. And her talk will be entitled Structural Thinking About Social Categories. You can find information about that talk and upcoming talks on our website, which is beck.ucla.edu. You can also find links to uh, past talks and videos, as well as a link under Get Involved, which enables you to sign up for our Beck listserv, which will um, which means that you will receive announcements for all of the upcoming talks. If you miss the talks um, live, uh, don't worry, I will be posting them on the YouTube channel later on the same week, so you can always go and view them there. So today it's um, my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Heidi Colloran from the Birth Rights Research Group at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig. And Heidi's talk is called Rethinking Reproduction in Human Evolutionary Research. Please join me in welcoming Heidi Colloran. Thank you very much. Oh, claps. Thank you yes. very, very much. Um, thanks so much for the invitation and uh, for your patience while we figured out the um, technical hitches of doing pandemic style talks via Zoom and screen sharing and everything else. Um, so uh, my name is Heidi Colloran and I'm an anthropologist uh, with a very broad training in evolutionary anthropology, anthropological demography, and um, with a lot of uh, fieldwork uh, orientation and experience. I'm interested in reproductive behavior. Um, and by that, I mean uh, behaviors that are related to uh, the times that you start and stop reproducing, the number of children that you end up having and the rate at which you have them. And I'm especially interested in understanding how processes at the individual level uh, and at the local level of aggregation um, scale up to generate demographic parameters um, of the sorts that most evolutionary research relies on. Uh, and in particular, how cultural mechanisms and institutions that drive reproductive decisions, uh, what we might call cultures of reproduction, scale up to affect the macro level demography of a population. Now, reproduction used to be core business in uh, most of anthropology. Um, but it, it's surprising because we actually know very, very little about the drivers of reproductive variation beyond a few basic uh, predictors um, that are often most applicable in Western contexts. So in this talk, uh, I wanna talk uh, a lot about the demographic transition to low fertility, which is a global transition to small family sizes that started in the late 1800s. And I use this as an explanatory device uh, to put pressure on our assumptions about how reproductive behavior is understood in evolutionary research. Knowing uh, about reproductive dynamics is really important because these dynamics underpin our understanding of macro scale demography. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the empirical work that I've been doing in Poland uh, since the beginning of my PhD, uh, in which I've been looking at multi level cultural um, and evolutionary uh, dynamic approaches to understanding demographic transition. Um, as well, I will touch a little bit on uh, the expansion of this work to a, a new field context in the Pacific in Vanuatu, uh, where I've been working for the last five years in, in a very different uh, ethnolinguistic context. Now, I also want to say what I'm not going to talk about. So I'm not going to touch on questions of the evolution of pair bonding or mating or the nuclear family. That's been covered by many uh, far better uh, biological and evolutionary anthropologists than I. I'm also not trying to say uh, reproduction is somehow not biologically constrained, um, but I'm not going to talk much about biological anthropology and the research in reproductive ecology, for example, um, that has done, uh, you know, that's been growing very rapidly in recent years. So what I'm focusing on is how social interactions and culture influence and organize how individuals navigate their reproduction and how these things generate these uh, bigger patterns. Um, and 
And like all good evolutionary stories, our journey begins in the distant, misty fogs of the largely unknowable past. Um, geneticists have uh, inferred that the effective population size of, of human ancestors living about uh, 1.2 million years ago uh, was at some point as low as about 18,000 uh, people. Now that's an idealization. Effective population size isn't necessarily the same as census population size, but that's how low uh, the population would have been at that time. And for most of human history after that point, uh, population growth has been low. Then uh, about 10,000 years before now, we get this signal in the paleoanthropological record of a relatively abrupt increase uh, in, in the proportion of juveniles uh, represented in the skeletal remains of burial sites all across the world. And that indicates a sharp increase uh, in the birth rate and a transition from what's assumed to be an equilibrium of low um, growth to a new equilibrium of relatively high growth. And this is called the Neolithic demographic transition. Uh, this term was coined by uh, the paleodemographer Jean-Pierre bouquet appel And the uh, argument, the typical narrative that sort of so is associated with this transition is that there's a combination of increased sedentism, among hunter-gatherers um, and uh, the innovation of agricultural techniques during the transition to agriculture that allowed for greater resource extraction and higher, ultimately higher uh, carrying capacity. And that, uh, in addition, reduces the energy budgets uh, for women, which allows them to invest that energy in higher fertility. So skip forward a few uh, relatively uninteresting millennia and uh, we can see what's thought of as the inverse of this process in the contemporary demographic transition, which is the transition that I'll be mostly talking about in this talk. And here uh, we see the transition from what looks like a fluctuating equilibrium of high fertility and high mortality to an assumed new uh, equilibrium at the end of this century of uh, low fertility and low mortality. And here's what the founder of this narrative uh, thought about the difference uh, between these two uh, major transitions. So he says that the major difference between the two demographic transitions is that the cause of the Neolithic one was effectively unconscious. It was determined by the mechanical effect of maternal energetics on maternal energetics of the invention of the agricultural economy. While the essential cause of the contemporary demographic transition was conscious, the will to control uh, reproduction. I hope you'll see that this is a relatively linear narrative that sort of moves smoothly from ecological determinism to sort of modern autonomy. Um, and the aim of my talk uh, and also of my research program is to highlight what I see as some problems with this distinction and to put pressure on it in a number of different ways so that we can better understand how human population dynamics uh, actually work. And um, the challenges begin pretty much straight away. So uh, this plot uh, from a paper in 2013 by uh, Shannon and colleagues shows uh, estimates of population densities uh, based on radiocarbon dates uh, in different uh, regions of Neolithic Europe. And what you see here are in red and in light blue, uh, statistically significant deviations from the null model of growth that's assumed for these populations, which is in the uh, dotted lines. And you see blue arrows, uh, which indicate the uh, first evidence for agriculture in each of these regions. Now, the thing to notice is, first of all, that these are boom and bust dynamics. Um, there are increases uh, followed by crashes in population density. And in every case, agriculture is associated uh, with these baby booms that are then followed by these crashes and recoveries. But what's really important here is that in every case, these changes are not associated with regional climate change. That means that these processes or whatever they are that are generating uh, these dynamics are endogenous. Um, they're not ecologically determined processes. But we don't know uh, what these could be and how can we find out about the mechanisms that might generate uh, this kind of uh, situation? Two strategies are typical uh, when you're in this kind of situation. The first thing is to go for a cross-species comparison to see what humans do that's different from other species. And the second um, thing to look at is to um, reach for ethnographic analogy by appealing to the ethnographic record. So um, Sarah Hurdy uh, 
if you haven't read her work, please do, because it's wonderful, um, is very important in exactly, exactly this kind of juncture, because um, she has really summarized beautifully uh, the uniqueness of the human um, life history, uh, the uniqueness of the human breeding system uh, in the context of the great apes um, and how um, they're in fact more similar in many ways to other animal species like birds. Um, this uh, plot on the bottom shows you comparative life histories for humans and uh, some uh, selected uh, non-human primates. And what you basically want to see here is that humans have a very, very long post-reproductive lifespan, so the white part of the bar, and a re relatively short um, adult reproductive span, which is the next part down. And so what that means is that humans are squeezing more reproduction into a shorter period of time. Um, and they are doing so even though they have a long reproductive lifespan left to live. And Sarah Hurdy really powerfully um, brought together lots and lots of different streams of evidence on this to argue that um, humans are effectively obligate cooperative breeders and that reproduction and the way that we reproduce uh, underlies the success of our species by outcompeting our nearest relatives through basically social mechanisms in, in the sense that we're able to manipulate the interbirth intervals uh, and the weaning ages of children by um, using other people to help us. Um, and uh, so this notion of it takes a village to raise a child is, is really baked into the, the basis of how human uh, reproductive uh, systems work. And uh, what's really important is that this underlies this incredible human population growth. And it's worth pointing out, um, you know, chimps and orangutans, for example, don't have this kind of system. Other species do like birds, as I mentioned, uh, and we do share some uh, life history characteristics that are, are quite similar with them. So Sarah Hardy says that cooperative breeding permitted effectively the evolution of our extended lifespans, uh, our prolonged childhoods and our big brains. Um, but the evolution of this kind of pro-social reproductive system uh, together with the evolution of language, the development of social conventions, the ability to internalize in-group norms um, all together sets the stage for a huge elaboration of reproductive dynamics in different parts of the world. However, it has to be said that culture doesn't really feature in this model. Um, and so now I want to show you uh, some examples of the kinds of reproductive mechanisms that exist around the world and how they generate uh, meso and macro level patterns. Rendi Lagra pastoralists in northern Kenya used to categorize women into age structured groups. And in one of these groups called the Sipad, uh, women were subject to very specific cultural rules that restricted and delayed their marriages well into their 30s. Now, being born into such an age set was highly prestigious, uh, but it limits the number of children that you could have. And one of the reasons that this particular social system is thought to have uh, existed and been maintained is partly because it may have endogenously regulated population growth by preventing the overexploitation of resources. In Indonesian Papua, uh, the Marind Anim had a practice called Otto Bombari, in which women had ritualized sexual intercourse with up to 10 men of their husband's clan on the night of their marriage or on their return to village life after childbirth. Now, while this was intended to uh, promote fertility, it actually, in many cases, led to widespread sterility uh, through sexually transmitted disease. And as a result, uh, anywhere between 10 and 25 percent of the population at any time was actually made up of kidnapped and adopted children from other ethno-linguistic groups as part of a rich cosmology uh, involving expansioning raiding and headhunting. In China and many other places, cultural preferences for sons over daughters have led to sex selective uh, infanticide and abortion. These generate extremely skewed sex ratios uh, and a staggering estimate of over 50 million so-called missing women in China alone. In Germany and other, plenty of other countries around the world, uh, what we might call cultures of childlessness are developing uh, and these down value biological reproduction altogether. And that's leading to rapid population aging uh, with about 40% uh, of Germans expected to be over the age of 60 by the middle of this century. Um, and in, in Vanuatu, the Pacific nation where I've been working for the last five years, there's a very complex system of uh, supernatural warfare over reproduction. Uh, typically, men use witchcraft uh, to prevent women 
uh, belonging to their rivals uh, from having safe and, su uh, and successful births. In turn, uh, a system of counter witchcraft is designed to cancel out attempts at reproductive sabotage. And mostly this rivalry actually happens within a patriline. But what it does is it makes women afraid of pregnancy and childbirth and it affects their desires to have uh, large families. The kinds of questions that we have to be able to answer as anthropologists is how do people make decisions about reproduction in these very different cultural contexts? How do enculturated reproductive decisions generate macro demographic patterns? And how do changes at the population level affect how these kinds of cultural mechanisms themselves change over time? But these questions take us to the intersection of anthropology, demography and cultural evolution uh, where I work and where the research group is uh, located. Reproduction is foundational to demography and to the broader study of human population genetics, but it's also the engine of evolution, both biological and, as I want to argue, cultural. But as you've seen, reproduction doesn't happen in a cultural vacuum. And so my claim is that we don't have a good understanding of the cultural variation in reproductive uh, behaviour as it exists. And because of that, we don't have a principled way to link micro, uh, micro level decisions to macro level demographic patterns. And this really matters because we're going through one of the most profound demographic changes in human history. Although there will be more people on the planet by the end of this century than there ever has been, the thing to remember is that billions of people from different religious, social, ethnic and linguistic groups living in different economies with different histories and value systems are all expected to voluntarily converge on a small family size by the end of this century. Now we need to be able to explain how this apparently global social norm is evolving and whether it can last. But how do we reconcile the huge variation in the cultural mechanisms that drive reproduction with the emergence of a global pattern like this? A classic economic and evolutionary models have struggled to explain the transition to low fertility as the outcome of a psychology that's designed to maximize genetic output. The transition process began long before the invention of modern contraceptives. So we know that it's not simply a question of technological innovation. The fact is that no other animal that we know of has responded to a systematic reduction in mortality and an increase in resources by reducing rather than increasing fertility. And for that reason, it's been called the central theoretical problem in the application of evolutionary principles to human behavior. And it's been the focus uh, of most of my work. Another reason that it really matters um, is because this lack of understanding about how reproduction works has major political ramifications and it can lead to sensationalist claims about the future of the human population. For example, this book published in the 70s and that argued that hundreds of millions of people were going to starve to death in that decade. Uh, and this led to fundamentally unethical proposals to solve the so-called population bomb from forced sterilization to taxation on large families to the withholding of development aid to high fertility countries. But these predictions were totally wrong because we simply don't know enough about why people reproduce the way they do. So what do we evolutionary researchers think? A few years ago, I wrote um, one of the first comprehensive reviews of the theoretical work that had been done on this question. And I found that there's at least 12 different evolutionary hypotheses for fertility decline, each of which gives a partial explanation at uh, different stages of that transition. Now, this literature exposes a number of important problems in our approach uh, to modeling reproductive behavior. The first is that we have a problem with equifinality. Uh, a wide range of models can produce fertility declines, but we haven't really articulated the mechanisms that drive reproductive patterns in a way that would allow us to provide mutually exclusive hypotheses to test. Secondly, many models use different mechanisms and assumptions depending on whether they're focusing on high or low fertility populations. And that leads to the problem that the conceptual implications uh, of how evolutionary processes work in human populations differ quite radically depending on the model that you use. Now I'm just going to pull out uh, one of the most important arguments made about fertility decline in evolutionary research, uh, which is to do with a quality quantity trade-off. Um, the idea here is that in high fertility societies, um, people tend to invest uh, less in a lot of children whereas in low fertility societies, people invest a lot in a small number of children. And that the demographic transition in conjunction with the expansion of markets and educational systems ushers in a multi-generational uh, 
quality quantity trade off. So the idea here, if you look at the top left uh, plot, is that you have this sweet spot uh, of reproductive output that would maximize your fitness in the next generation. So the number of children you should have in order to maximize the number of grandchildren that you would have. And this is often made in conjunction with arguments about changing fertility currencies in the context of modern reproduction. So we're, we're no longer investing in uh, wealth for, for its own sake because wealth is no longer correlated with high fertility. We're investing in human capital and human capital has these nonlinear payoffs. However, if you look at the second plot on the top, um, this is from Hilly Kaplan's work in the 90s. Um, you don't see this quadratic relationship represented in the empirical data. What you see is a linear relationship. The more children you have, the more grandchildren you have. Uh, and extrapolating to multiple generations, um, as you see on the bottom here, um, this is work by Goodman and colleagues um, looking at multiple generations uh, over uh, time in Sweden. Uh, you see this linear pattern replicated across generations. So basically, there is no evidence at the moment uh, of a fitness advantage to having smaller family sizes in the long term. Nobody's cashing in on that reproductive advantage uh, in the long term. But I do think our problem here is far greater than whether we can find evidence for a quality quantity trade-off. I think our problem is that there's a blind spot at the heart of evolutionary anthropology. We treat almost everything else as if it were culturally evolving, except reproduction. Reproduction instead is typically understood as a natural or a biological fact. It's narrowly tied to energetics and resource acquisition, and it's somehow prior to or separate from culture. The reality is that there's no such thing as a, a natural state of fertility. Um, but this kind of thinking lets us slip into thinking that high fertility is somehow unregulated and low fertility is more the result of conscious decision making. That creates problematic dichotomies between so-called uh, traditional and modern populations, which are based purely on how many children people have, when instead we should be seeing this as part of the spectrum of diversity. This is compounded by the fact uh, that reproduction is often thought of as a private or domestic activity generally limited to women, when in fact how, when and where people reproduce is often a public and a political part of a group's culture. Now, these slippages uh, are not limited to just thinking about contemporary demographic transitions, but they limit our theorizing uh, because they make the cultural influences on reproduction invisible. And that's exactly uh, what researchers working across the social sciences have been saying for decades. Um, reproduction is invisibly central to human social life, but it's visibly marginal in our theorizing. And we currently don't have a way to integrate the work that's being done in many, many different disciplines with the kinds of debates uh, that are happening in evolution and demography. And um, I feel the first step to doing so is to start interrogating what we mean by natural fertility and decide whether we even need it. So here we go. Um, Louis Henri came up with uh, the definition of natural fertility, and this is his revised definition, um, which is that fertility is natural if it exists or has existed in the absence of deliberate birth control. He prefers to call it natural to physiological, since the factors that affect natural fertility are not solely physiological. Social factors can also play their part, sexual taboos, for example, during lactation. Control can be said to exist when the behavior of the couple is bound to the number of children that are already born and is modified when that number reaches the maximum that the couple doesn't want to exceed. If you're feeling confused and a little angry at this point, you're not alone. Um, there are two components here, at least, that are confusing. Um, the idea that social factors are included in the concept of something that should be naturalized and the idea of um, binding uh, reproductive decisions to a, a quantity, to a number of children. Um, but what's really important to understand about this concept of natural fertility is that it turns less on the idea of a distinction between biological and cultural determinants of reproduction and more on this idea of passive versus deliberative or unconscious versus conscious reproductive strategizing. So it's quite similar, uh, in fact, it's identical to the logic behind the quote uh, that I told you right at the beginning of the talk. So before going on to uh, deconstruct this uh, a bit more, I want to just conceptualize a bit how natural uh, fertility um, uh, 
gets used in evolutionary anthropology and why it has this particular position that is this kind of invisible assumption that many of us use. Um, first thing is that um, it, most of the research that employs concepts of natural fertility is done arguably by uh, human behavioural ecologists, which is the field that I actually started out in. Um, and the models that uh, behavioural ecologists draw on are borrowed from the non-human literature, which is typically focused on adaptive fitness maximising behaviour. As a result of that, we, um, we have a, a fair amount of reliance on rational actor approaches um, to reproductive decision making. Now, these rational actor approaches, so cost benefit analyses effectively, these don't imply that individuals are consciously strategizing their reproduction. Um, they're acting as if they were. But what's important here is that it actually diverts us from thinking about psychology and moves us on to thinking about proxy variables, uh, such as wealth or status, uh, things that are assumed to be associated with um, reproductive success, but sort of bypass the question of how these uh, decisions are actually made. And the critique that comes out of that uh, is, you know, that uh, behavioral ecology effectively black boxes uh, this aspect of our psychology. Uh, and this is the famous behavioral gambit that behavior ecology gets criticized a lot for. Another outcome of taking this kind of approach is that it ends up emphasizing uh, methodological individualism as an approach to understanding reproductive decision making. And it de-emphasizes the, uh, uh, the importance of social institutions, of cultural norms, of social facts that exist beyond the individual level of analysis. Um, and in, uh, in the process, uh, culture is viewed as proximate mechanism. The idea here is that the fitness maximizing psychology that has evolved over evolutionary time spans is functional, um, that periods of mismatch um, can be explained by the concept of adaptive lag. So there just hasn't been enough time for natural selection to kick in and um, uh, you know, select for individuals who prefer to have higher fertility in the case of the demographic transition. But what this tends to do as well is it tends to make our reproductive theorizing very ahistorical. Um, so it's a very abstract way of viewing the world and it sort of, it, it, it leaves us without historical understanding of how these things are, are changing over time. Um, and a final uh, part of the story is the fact that um, we just need a baseline. Um, it's one of the reasons why natural fertility as a concept is very appealing. And as it's used, for example, in paleodemography or uh, archaeology, um, you know, the ideas uh, that natural uh, fertility can help us understand are to do with things like species typical human life history uh, features or species typical physiological adaptations that have occurred over really, really long periods of time. And they're not as focused on variation, which is what most of evolutionary anthropology is actually focused on. And, and moreover, those ideas are kind of focused on a history of very strong ecological determinism. In those fields, you end up with demography as a consequence of uh, often exogenous factors that are coincidentally amenable to measurement, so things like climate change, um, rather than as a cause um, of these things. And so with that in mind, um, I'm going to complicate this idea even further. Because natural fertility isn't the same thing as high fertility. Um, and this is really critical. So uh, these two plots are from uh, Gillian Bentley and colleagues work in the, in the 90s, where they looked at the distribution of total fertility among uh, a, a global sample of natural fertility populations. So the black bars represent agriculturalists and the non-black bars um, are disaggregations of foragers and horticulturalists, but everybody's uh, counted as a natural fertility population. And the thing to notice is that these distributions substantially overlap. So using a high, low fertility cutoff isn't going to help you make any claims about, uh, you know, the social system that's, uh, that these particular groups of people are engaged in. Because you can have a low fertility farming population, um, you can also have a relatively high fertility foraging population. And so coming further into this idea that I find very confusing that sociocultural factors are included in the concept of natural fertility means that some of the populations um, that I mentioned right at the beginning uh, would count as natural fertility populations 
Um, so the rendial age grades um, that uh, effectively segregate uh, reproduction into different age groups, um, that would be considered natural fertility. Um, the Marindan and practice of Otif Bombari, which actually led to infertility in many cases and which uh, provided momentum, increasing momentum for expansionary raiding and kidnapping, that would be considered natural fertility. The preference, the overwhelming preference for sons due to inheritance and all sorts of other cultural imperatives in China is not considered part of natural fertility. Um, and I'll leave you to draw your own implications about you know, why that might be. Um, similarly, the idea that people are developing these cultures where they don't value reproduction anymore and they're interested in being childless or it's, it's okay to be child free, these are also not considered to be cultural features that are included under the concept of natural fertility. And, and remember, the distinction here is about deliberative decision making. The implication is that these effectively smaller scale groups are deliberating less about their reproduction. Um, and it, it's very uh, confusing because it seems we can only include some features that are cultural that influence reproduction and not others. And um, it's not very clear which ones go in and which ones don't. So I want to take um, what might seem to you to be the hard case here and show you uh, a bit more about how all cultures are cultures of reproduction. So I'm going to talk a bit more about Germany. So we don't have to look to exoticized non-Western places uh, to see how cultural features are actually influencing uh, people's reproduction. Um, in Germany, there's this very old concept of uh, raven mother um, and the German is Rabenmutter. This is a concept that was coined by a German naturalist in 1350 and which is very, very much alive today in German um, thinking about reproduction and family dynamics. So, the raven mother is um, a, a mother that leaves her children in the nest, uh, that goes back to work after reproduction. And it's a derogatory term that's used to shame women who um, don't sufficiently care for their children. Um, in the post-war division of Germany into East and West, um, this incredible natural social experiment emerged because the experience of communism in former Eastern Germany has left a completely different legacy uh, in reproductive values because they were encouraged and supported to work as well as reproduce. Um, and that didn't happen in the West. In the West, highly educated women are much, more, much, much more likely to remain childless. Um, they're also much less likely to have children outside of marriage in comparison to former Eastern Germany where uh, almost 50% of children were born outside of wedlock um, in, the 90, in the 80s and 90s. Um, but also in Eastern Germany, women tend to start reproduction at a much earlier age and they tend to more readily envisage being working mothers, which is just not as acceptable uh, in Western Germany. And these um, phenomena leave legacies uh, of history, of very recent history, in um, the values that people use to think about their reproduction. So here's just some social statistics comparing both values and uh, activities of women in Eastern and Western Germany. So in the 1990s, 25% of West Germans agreed that homemaking was their dream job compared to 3% of East German women. In the same period, 80% of West German women were married within the year that their first uh, child was born compared to 45% in Eastern Germany. In 97, um, only 10% of West German women were in full-time work by the time their children uh, went to school. And, and remember in Germany, this is quite a late age. It's about six years old by the time kids go to school compared to Eastern Germany, which is, about th which is more than three times higher. The percent of women using daycare uh, in West Germany is far lower at 27% compared uh, to Eastern Germans. And this is in 2012, so this is relatively recent. And as recently as 2014, these, these, these sort of legacies are evident in the values um, and opinions of people. So uh, when asked the question whether young children suffer if their mothers return to work, 32% of West German women agreed, 13% of East German women agreed. And uh, massive differences also in the number of women who agreed that childcare should primarily be done by the family. Um, and, and that typically means by the mother. So the point here is that we don't need to go over long historical periods and we don't need to go to exotic locations to find evidence that culture really affects 
the way people think about their reproduction. And this kind of thing has massive ramifications when you scale it up. So coming back to the idea of natural fertility and the idea of deliberative uh, reproductive strategizing, contraception is always the first thing that comes to people's mind. Um, now, I really want to make this point very strongly that the, con the idea of consciously trying to manipulate your reproduction is not a recent obsession. Um, this is just a, a tiny collection of purported contraceptives from across the ages, some of them more controversial than others, but um, it's good to think about them. So the, starting from the, from the top right, we have um, an engraving of, of an abortion on the walls of Angkor Wat. Moving to the left, we have a 1920s IU, solid gold IUD. We go to apparently a cave painting of a condom, I'm not sure I believe that one. We go down to a coin which comes uh, from um, ancient Cyrenia in modern day Libya, where uh, we see the plant Silphium uh, represented on the front of this coin. And Silphium was a well known contraceptive. And according to some sources, um, this contraceptive was harvested almost to extinction. Um, but it was incredibly important, important enough to be on the coinage of the society. And on the back of that coin is a symbol that we associate with the love heart, but some historians argue is representative of the womb. So this was really important back then. Um, going down, the crocodile is there because the ancient Egyptians used crocodile dung as a pessary. Um, many, many societies use lots of different um, kinds of elements to, to, to block um, conception. Uh, we see a 13th century uh, condom made out of sheepskin. We see uh, on the bottom right um, lots of different um, sort of noxious substances that have been used as douches um, in the developing world, but also in the, U in the US. So the Lysol ad is from 1920s USA. And in the middle is my favorite. It's, the, it's a medieval necklace of rabbit's anuses, which was supposed to uh, limit uh, conception, but probably only limited sex. Um, but the whole point here is that um, if contraception isn't new, then the motivation to do something about your reproduction also isn't new. And that's the thing that we want to understand. Um, now you might come back and say, okay, yeah, yeah, but um, those are not effective contraception, contraceptives and the things we're interested in are, are effective contraception. Apart from the fact that for most kinds of contraception, the effectiveness of it depends on perfect use. Um, the point here is that um, the demographic transition, at least, began long before the invention of so-called modern effective methods of contraception. Um, and so this isn't really an argument against uh, this kind of, uh, you know, wanting to place deliberative decision making on a firm footing. Moreover, birth control is highly possible without the use of modern methods of contraception. So these are just some data from uh, selected uh, Western countries. And if you look at the bottom there, you can see uh, Greece, Japan, Portugal, and Italy, some of the lowest fertility countries in the whole world, um, achieving low fertility with very, very low rates of uh, modern contraceptive use. So it's perfectly possible. So to sum up, I hope I've convinced you that um, natural fertility is confusing, enraging, and possibly itself a confused concept. Now I want to tell you a bit more about the empirical work that I've done that focuses on explaining reproductive variation uh, in a high fertility context in rural Poland, where I sort of went in as a behavioral ecologist and came out as a cultural evolutionist and an anthropological demographer. Um, so I want to tell you about uh, the data that I collected. This is all collected between 2009 and 2010 from 2000 women living in 22 different rural communities. 65% um, of households were uh, subsistence farmers at the time of uh, interview, but only 4% were still exclusively subsisting from farmers. So there's a real range uh, of, of market integration here. It's a very uh, ethno-linguistically uh, homogenous uh, context. Um, and most people, there was one Jehovah's Witness in the sample. Um, I have very detailed demographic and socioeconomic data to the closest approximation randomly sampled, uh, both within and between communities. Um, and I have data on about a thousand different variables spanning about hundred years of reproduction. And these include ego networks, contraceptive use, personality data, fertility preferences. And I'm hoping to start a new wave of data collection this year. So all the results I'm going to show you are, are using multi-level statistical models with the following kind of structure. So you always see uh, women clustered within um, communities. 
uh, and there's some um, set of controls. I'm not going to bore you with those details. I'm just going to show you results. Um, but the outcome that I'm interested in is always uh, an individual level variable, such as fertility, so total, uh, total fertility, um, probability of contraceptive use and network structure. So starting with um, contraceptives, we collected uh, data on over 15 different types of contraceptives and we found that um, counting natural methods um, actually nearly doubles the estimated prevalence rate uh, for contraceptive use in this population. And we split these into natural and artificial methods, though um, other studies tend to uh, make the distinction between traditional and modern contraception instead. And what you see is that uh, these natural methods are by far the most prevalent methods. What we then see is that actually women are successfully reducing their fertility in these communities by stopping early uh, and shortening their reproductive spans, largely driven by the use of natural methods rather than these artificial methods. So people have lower completed fertility, they have um, an earlier age at last birth, they have a shorter reproductive span, and they have a lower under five infant mortality if they used any method of contraception, but it doesn't make an additional difference if they used a, uh, an artificial method of contraception. And going further, um, what we actually see is that contraceptive use itself, whether you use any method or whether you use an artificial method, is highly socially structured. So this is just a sample of some results from a paper uh, from 2015. And uh, what it shows is that social clustering is extremely important in these data. Um, the private social spaces of women's ego networks are places where um, they can experiment with new kinds of uh, methods of contraception. And what we see is that, all you basically want to see here is the deviation from the line of zero. Um, and what you basically see here is that for every additional user in your ego network, of which there is a maximum of five, the probability of you using the respective method, so any method versus an artificial method, increases very, very significantly. And um, individual characteristics like education and wealth in this analysis, they're important, but they're not as important as this. And they have very inconsistent associations uh, across these different types of methods. So the point that the slide is trying to make is that contraceptive uh, behavior is, is learned behavior. These are, people are learning about how to, how to and whether to and which methods to use in the safety of their social networks. More evidence for learning and social transmission comes from analyses of how educational levels influence fertility um, at both the community level as well as the individual level. So, um, the question here um, was, how does the education of other women in your community influence your own um, reproductive outcomes, so your own fertility? So looking um, first uh, at these plots, what these show are predicted probabilities from multi-level models where a woman's number of births is the outcome. And I'm going to just show you the differences across communities that are net of all the different kinds of effects that we have in these models. So looking at the first plot, plot A, what you see is average fertility is going down as average community, uh, average education in the community is going up. So what that means is that a person who has low education, so pluck a random woman with low education, if she happens to be living in a community that has very high education, she will have uh, up to half the number of children um, compared to the same woman in a less educated community. Uh, purely because she's living around other people who have high education. So it's independent of her own educational status. Looking at, at um, plot B, what you see is that, um, what you see here is average education in the community um, on the bottom here and the variation in fertility. And what you see is variation in fertility itself is going down as the average education in the community goes up. And that makes sense because if everybody's getting educated, uh, and everybody's reducing fertility, then the, the, the drop in this variance, this convergence on a small family size is happening uh, just in this, it's just compositional. It's happening just because convergence on uh, high education is also happening. So if that's true, we'd expect to see exactly the same pattern in plot C, 
um, where we see uh, variance in education in the community against variance in predicted fertility. And here you don't see a pattern. And that's what's really, really interesting here, because what that says is that something else is driving this convergence on low fertility. This convergence is independent of individual characteristics. So what that means is less educated women reduce their fertility in the presence of higher educated women, independent of their own characteristics. So then, of course, the question is, what's driving the convergence? Is it that there are clusters of educated people together in these networks? Um, and just briefly uh, to show you what these network data look like, um, interviewees named up to up to five female friends uh, that they could talk to about important personal matters. Um, typically, the size of the network was around uh, three people, and that's consistent with um, ego network data that's been collected in many different uh, studies. These are close uh, personal networks. Um, they're not transient. Um, the mean duration of these networks is about 20, 28 years, 23 years. Um, and they're characterized by a high degree of proximity and a high degree of interpersonal contact. Um, we have a range of variables on all of the alters in these networks, including education. So we're able to calculate the mean educational level of the friends that a woman nominated. And what you see here is interesting because what you see on the left is that as community education goes up, so does the average education of her ego network. And that's not surprising if you assume homophily, if you assume that everybody's just interacting with people who are similar to them. But this pattern is true also for alters who are living outside the community, as you see in the second plot here. And that's really, really cool, because what that means is that low educated women are interacting with high educated women, both inside and outside their communities. And the reason that's interesting is because it provides potential evidence for a mechanism for between group transmission of low fertility norms. So to sum this up, what it means is that higher education in the community is somehow associated with more interaction with high educated women at an individual level, but that interaction is taking place both within the community, so based on the actual composition of that particular community, but also it's happening outside the community. So we have to ask ourselves a further question, what's driving the change in these networks? Is the structure of social interactions itself changing through these demographic transitions? And that's actually part of a very long standing hypothesis, which is that kin networks loosen with economic change uh, as domestic and economic activities start to take place in uh, different places. And that's also important for thinking about kin support and the cooperative breeding model, the idea that this cooperative breeding model is effectively breaking down in the course of the demographic transition. Now, not many people have thought about this in terms of culturally evolutionary impacts because um, kin networks do something really interesting um, when it comes to information flow. They, they channel the vested interests of families. Uh, they're a source of vertical transmission, of conformity, of stability in these kind of reproductive norms. Kin networks also create and maintain boundaries uh, between different kind of subgroups within communities. And so <clears throat> we want to look at this, and this is um, from a paper that I published just earlier this year. Um, now, as you know, everyone has five uh, network partners in the maximum. So this is just a theoretical example of what, uh, what we did here. We know the nature of the ties between um, the alters in the network. So we know if they're genealogical uh, or, or a final ties. And what, uh, what we did was we measured the density of each woman uh, has her own ego network. So we measured the density of her network. But I also proposed this new measure of kin density. And there's an important difference here. So um, if you're counting the nature of the ties between individuals, as opposed to counting the number of nodes of a certain type. So let's say you're looking at the proportion of kin. The proportion of kin in the network is not the same thing as the proportion of edges that are kinship connections. So that means that the composition of the network is not the same as the structure of it. And that really matters because if you look on the bottom here, um, if women, if you look on the bottom left here, if women uh, nominate three kin members in their network and you just count how many kin are represented, um, that's quite different from if they nominate uh, affines as well as uh, consanguineal kin, because those affines and consanguineal kin themselves may not be related. And this is important because if women uh, tend to add the kin of their husband, let's say, after they get married, their affines, uh, 
What can actually happen is that the density of kin connections in the network can decline, even though the proportion of kin in the network remains identical. And kin density hasn't been measured in this way before. Um, so we wanted to know, does this feature of networks itself change as these communities are becoming more market integrated? But just before I go on, um, the correlations between these different measures are not particularly strong. Um, so we see that larger eco networks tend to be a tiny little bit less dense, uh, so dense on the top here, but they don't tend to be less kin dense. And network density and kinship density are not strongly correlated with each other. So that's, that's useful. So just looking at the observed um, data here, what you see is that um, in, the, in the Polish data, the, uh, the average uh, density uh, across these eco networks is, is quite high. Um, so 80% of possible connections are present given the size of the network that we measured. Um, and kin density um, is a lot lower, but it hasn't really been measured on average. Uh, you see uh, the density goes down as uh, the community uh, market integration increases. Looking uh, in more detail at this through the lens of multi-level regression, uh, what we basically see is that independent of your own household market integration, which has an important effect on uh, the kinship density of your ego network, the market integration of others in your community, just as with the educational measures, um, also has a very significant effect on the loosening of your kin network. So for every standard deviation increase um, in market integration at the household level, you have an 11% reduction in the odds of having kinship connections in your network. Um, at the community level, that reduction, the same amount uh, of increase, so a standard deviation increase is associated with a 15% reduction. And this is not due to not having kin to put in that network, because these same results are found in every subset of the data that I could come up with. If you only focus on the subset of married women or the subset of women who have one sibling or no siblings or the subset of women who are farmers or the subset of women who have never migrated out of their community, the effects are qualitatively identical in all of those subsets. So this is a very robust pattern. So summarizing um, this empirical and this kind of conceptual work, um, Again, I hope I've convinced you that natural fertility is a confusing, if not a confused concept. I also hope I'm convincing you that um, contraceptive behavior is clearly occurring in, in every society that we know about. Um, from this empirical research, I'm also hoping to make the point that contraceptive method choice itself is socially, is socially learned and therefore subject to these cultural transmission dynamics. And that individual characteristics are not the only things that matter when you're measuring these things. Uh, independent of all of that, the structure of social networks themselves are starting to change during the demographic transition. Um, and uh, so I hope that I, I've put at least that much on a fairly solid footing uh, in what I've said so far. And I just want to take a few more minutes uh, to tell you a bit more about the work that we are doing in the research group um, in Leipzig. So this is uh, an interdisciplinary group um, that's focused on all the questions that I've been raising in this talk so far. Um, and it started uh, just at the beginning of this year and it will go for the next five years. Um, the challenge uh, of our group is, uh, is pretty big. We need to integrate uh, a dispersed literature, as I mentioned. We need to be able to account for both high and low fertility in ancestral and contemporary populations. And we need to try to start linking micro-level reproductive decisions to micro-level patterns. And the way I'm thinking about reframing this is by orienting this effort uh, around three central uh, uh, sort of questions. So the first is, how does culture influence uh, reproductive decisions? Um, what I mean by that is, how, what kinds of mechanisms, uh, whether they're purely cultural, technological or social, influence people's reproduction? Secondly, how do historical, cultural and other features of a population channel the trajectory of, a popula uh, of the demography? And um, how are these things path dependent? So how do cultures of reproduction themselves generate demographic patterns? And finally, how do demographic properties themselves influence how culturally evolutionary uh, features of reproduction are evolving? <laughs> 
So what are the logical implications of different kinds of demographic structures? For example, the age structures here uh, that are shown for different countries uh, on how information about reproduction is transmitted. So each of these components is going to require um, different kinds of questions at different levels of analysis. And so we're going to tackle this with three interrelated streams of research. We're going to look at micro-level field studies that give us high levels of uh, resolution in the data, but at the cost of a low level of generalizability. We're going to look at macro-level uh, cross-cultural and historical analyses that will give us higher levels of generalizability, but at a lower level of resolution. And we're going to look at multi-level um, modeling and theory to help us connect uh, micro foundations with these uh, macro patterns. And I think cultural evolution is a useful framework um, for doing this because um, it has uh, a basis in, uh, well, firstly, it's based on formal modeling to begin with, which specializes precisely in connecting micro and macro levels of analysis, uh, including things like feedback and emergence. Um, and that allows us to collect level, connect levels of analysis that haven't been connected before and to bridge disciplines uh, in conversation in perhaps ways that hasn't been achievable. Uh, but cultural evolution isn't just a mathematical sort of um, exercise. It's, it's an integrative arena for interdisciplinary research that incorporates everything from formal modeling to ethnography and experiments. But also cultural evolution is a very young field and the models remain relatively simplistic and desperately need input uh, from people working uh, in the more ethnographic side of things. Um, and it, it's a wonderful opportunity to get involved uh, in this field at the, at the sort of foundational stages. Now, whatever you think about how culture is defined in cultural evolution, whether you're happy with the informational definition, the fact that culture is broadly defined as socially transmitted information, behavior, technology and institutions means that we can study both the processes and the products of culture at the same time. And I think that's really, really powerful. This project is going to um, develop uh, the fieldwork that I've already done, but it's also developing new fieldworks. So we have two different field contexts at the moment which offer us very different approaches to understanding uh, reproductive dynamics. So in Poland, as I mentioned, this is a, a very ethno-linguistically uh, homogenous place um, where we can look uh, at very closely controlled differences between communities in reproductive dynamics without having to worry about certain confounding features um, like religious variation uh, in different communities. And we have existing data um, that I already talked about, but we're also planning a, a new wave of data collection, which unfortunately we weren't able to do because of coronavirus, um, but we will continue to work uh, on that in the future hopefully. Um, and I'm also expanding a similar research program in Vanuatu, similarly constrained at the moment through coronavirus. But the, the point of working in Vanuatu is that we're sort of flipping the design on its head. Vanuatu is one of the most extremely diverse linguistically and culturally uh, places on the planet. And so here we're going to be looking at maximal amounts of variation in uh, reproductive dynamics as a result of this very tight um, tightly clustered, but very highly diverse um, social milieu. Uh, some of the work that uh, has already started is looking at the cultural evolution of reproductive norms. So uh, Elena Mew has just joined the group uh, a couple of months ago as a postdoc, and she's going to be looking at questions to do with how notions of prestige themselves get related to reproduction. Um, because we assume one of the central claims in the cultural evolutionary literature about the demographic transition is that we have high prestigious people and we copy them and that's how we end up getting low fertility. That's a gross simplification, but uh, left sort of unchallenged often is the question of how low fertility gets to be high prestige. So this is one of the questions that she's going to be focusing on. In addition to looking at other kinds of reproductive norms uh, evolving in contemporary uh, Western context. So uh, with Michelle Klein as well, we're all going to be working together on some web-based uh, studies that are going to be looking at the social monitoring of reproduction, how people who are pregnant are experiencing both privately and publicly intense amounts of social monitoring in their daily lives and how that affects them, where it comes from and why people seem to find it so important to tell somebody in the queue at Starbucks that they shouldn't be drinking coffee which um, is, is you know, mind-boggling when you start hearing the stories. 
we're also doing web-based surveys of uh, contemporary pregnancy taboos so the food and other kinds of restrictions that people are subject to where they're learning them from and how accurate they are we're going to be going into historical demography uh, to tackle some of these questions about lineage dynamics um, we're right at the beginning of that process but we're hoping to have historical data from a number of different places um, and finally, in terms of the modeling at the moment, um, what we're doing is this uh, really interesting collaborative project together with Adam Powell and Richard McElroy uh, in the department in Leipzig to develop an interactive uh, software environment for democratizing the modeling approach uh, when it comes to trying to understand uh, the cultural evolution uh, of demography and the demographic implications of cultural evolution. So this will be um, a software environment that has agent-based modeling under the hood, but that you don't need to be a programmer to use. So what we're going to do is you'll have some interface. This is a very basic prototype, but we're going to have some interface where you'll be able to choose a particular kinship system, for example, or a particular inheritance system, you'll be able to tell it what kind of vital rates uh, are involved, uh, what the growth rate and the death rate and the migration rate looks like, um, and various other parameters, but you'll be able to do that interactively without having to be a programmer or a modeler. And this software will then give you uh, population trajectories. It will tell you something about the population pyramid. It will track genetic fitness. Uh, over the course of a longer term trajectory. So this is a project that uh, we just launched um, this month. So we're hoping that by the end of the program, we'll be able to have an open source uh, software package that people can use to actually design their own models, test their own hypotheses, and instantiate their own ideas about how demography and culture co-evolve. Uh, I want to finish by just saying that I think these uh, these approaches have uh, implications for lots of fields because demography and culture are becoming really, really crucial uh, sort of um, centers of activity in many, many different disciplines. But the problem is that most of this research takes a unidirectional, unicausal approach uh, to how this works, uh, effectively um, you know, recapitulating these ecologically determinist arguments. So we always go from um, demography, uh, sorry, demography to culture or demography to um, some feature of the environment. We never really go from culture back to demography. And so that's really what this group is about. And just to give you an example, um, the demographic assumptions that are inherent in uh, a field like population genetics, um, which makes a number of very, very strong demographic assumptions, uh, such as in this uh, tree model here, where you look at effective population sizes, um, which are represented by the width of the branches of these trees. Uh, these make very, very strong assumptions about um, how demography works, including assumptions about random mating, about fixed generation times, um, about um, a lack of age structure or reproductive structure in any population. Um, and uh, I hope I've convinced you that any one of these demographic features is probably culturally evolving over time and could have important ramifications for how we infer human migrations in the past and the dispersal of populations around the world. And finally, um, population projections differ very dramatically um, depending on the kind of reproductive um, outcomes that you focus on. And many of the reproductive parameters in this area uh, are, are based on pretty fixed notions of how reproduction works. So we only need a difference of about half a child, plus or minus, uh, from the median population projection to give us absolutely vast global uh, differences in the future of the human population. But even the most recent models of sustainability of human population continue to make ecologically determinist assumptions about how humans reproduce. And we can do so much better than the population one if we just acknowledge and understand and try to focus our attention on the fact that populations all over the world at every period of time have tried to regulate their reproduction, have engaged in deliberative decision making when it comes to their reproduction, and have culturally evolved features um, that are co-evolving with the demography uh, itself a product of those reproductive decisions. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heidi. If you'd like to unmute yourself for a moment, let's uh, thank Heidi for a great talk. And um, since we started about 15 to 20 minutes late, um, Heidi, I don't know if you can stick around for an additional 15 minutes after. Yeah, no okay, problem. Great.
So I'll, I know some people may have to leave, but I'll leave the discussion open um, until about 1.45 or so, our time. And um, I, will, I will call on people. I think that what I'll also do is write the current queue um, into the public chat so that you can see who's next um, in the queue. And uh, when one person finishes talking, another person can then start. So um, who would like to ask the first question? Didn't see any hands yet. No questions. Okay, uh, we'll go okay. for it. Oh, we sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Who is who? Who is speaking? Oh, it's it's Maddie. Hey. Hi, Maddie. Why don't you go first, and then we'll do, and then we'll take Dan's question. Yeah. Oh. Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't see the Dan. That's okay. No, please do. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Yeah. You know, I was hoping I'd have time to like, you know, figure this out while someone else is speaking, but I'll just go for it. So I have been thinking about, I suppose, what gets to count as a, a contraceptive method. If, if something, you know, even not that often, but sometimes influences spontaneous abortion rates, miscarriage rates, then is that something we should be um, thinking about and integrating into our, yeah, hypotheses about this stuff? Um, so I'm thinking about like, you know, uh, pollution related to industrialization. I'm thinking about um, food we eat, uh, quote unquote, recreational drug use, those sorts of things. So. Yeah, that's not really a question, but I'd love to hear your thinking on that vague sort of topic. And, and that was an amazing presentation, by the way, very lucid for an incredibly complex topic that like boggles my mind. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That's very, very kind. Um, your question is massive and I will try and break it down a little bit. So first of all, things like spontaneous abortion and miscarriage are generally speaking understood as part of natural fertility. So those would be what uh, demographers call the proximate determinants uh, of fecundability. So your ability to conceive and actually have children. So this, if it's spontaneous, um, it's considered natural. But of course, your question leads into the much more complex question of uh, what's the cause of spontaneous abortion or miscarriage? And of course, the cause of that could also be deliberate action. Um, and uh, there's no question that abortion and uh, infanticide included um, are very widespread in the ethnographic record. Um, so uh, abortion, I think in some, on some accounts, uh, they include abortion as part of natural fertility. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it does get included. But I think it just muddies the water even further. You know, it just, it gets more and more confusing the more you think about it. Um, and it just makes me want to throw the idea away even more. Um, when it comes to things like um, partitioning the causes of spontaneous abortion into things that are more or less cultural, um, I think it's also really difficult because if you have, let's say you have more abortion, spontaneous abortion in a highly industrialized, um, dirty environment uh, as, you, as you had in the course of the industrial revolution, um, that environment is itself culturally um, evolving. So, uh, you know, the point at which we start dividing up, you know, natural from non-natural causes, I think just gets really arbitrary. Um, and I think when we expose um, the distinctions that do exist to further scrutiny, the arbitrariness of those distinctions becomes really evident and um, unquestionable. Um, and we have to start questioning where, uh, you know, the hidden biases are. Great. Yeah. Uh, Again, a very elusive response to a very complicated question that I didn't fully form. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Rice, uh, there's a Bill Rice 2018 paper that uh, suggests that, that humans have a really high spontaneous abortion rate. So I'm really, that's it's a very interesting topic, but uh, yes, thank you. And, and I wonder if some populations have figured that out, you know? Yeah. Helped yeah. it along. A lot, a lot more to do. So thank you for yeah. taking the question. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, next question is from Dan. 
Thanks, Heidi. That was uh, very stimulating and, and, you know, kind of breathtaking in its scope. Um, I, I wonder if I can push you a little bit to clarify some of the ideas and statements that you made. So um, early in the presentation, you were pretty clear in distinguishing conscious choices that individuals are making. And you subsequently elaborated on the social sources of information that can affect those decisions. Um, from you, made, you, you distinguish those from, for example, a cultural context in which um, cultural beliefs and practices may be influencing fertility and reproduction, but it's not clear that in, in any way this has anything to do with conscious choices on the part of the actors, right? So the, the Melanesian example of, uh, you know, um, resulting sterility from a, a belief in practice, um, it's not that individuals are choosing to lower their own biological reproduction and choosing to adopt as a consequence of that. It's that they have a set of ideas that are factually inaccurate about what enhances fertility, right? Um, and yet, given that sort of very important dichotomy, because uh, of course, you know, individual welfare and, and, and group welfare are not always aligned, and so cultural evolution can produce um, uh, beliefs and practices that not only don't enhance individual biological fitness, but um, uh, may not enhance individual happiness and satisfaction, right? All kinds of dimensions, or, or even longevity, all kinds of dimensions of, of individual welfare. Right? Uh, and yet, at the end of your presentation, you said all cultures, or something to the effect of all societies throughout time, have regulated their fertility. And that, of course, is now completely blurring this distinction between um, how much are people responding on the basis of conscious choice in the context of socially presented cultural information and how much are they subject to influences um, that are the product of cultural evolution, which by the way is not always adaptive for either individuals or groups, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the extinctions happen all the time in any evolutionary process, right? Um, uh, um, uh, which, uh, are totally beyond the realm of individual choice, right? Um, and then just to kind of muddy the waters even further, of course, um, issues like um, the differing goals and incentives and power structures of the individuals involved. So it's one thing to say, well, look at all these artifacts of contraception. It's another thing to say, you know, women in a highly patriarchal society may have very little agency with regard to regulating their own reproduction, even when their interests do not coincide with those of their male partners, right? So um, I, 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 I salute you for tackling the full breadth of the phenomenon instead of, you know, um, uh, myopically narrowing it to only one of these dimensions. And yet at the same time, I worry, how do you take account of these very, very different levels of explanation and potentially conflicts among them. Thank you. That was an amazing set of questions and I will do my best to do justice um, in answering them. Uh, and, I'm, and I appreciate the, um, the rigor with which you pose the question because you touch on a lot of things that I didn't have time to talk about and which I'm very happy to. Um, I think there are I, I, yeah, I think it's easy to give um, the impression that there are contradictory uh, streams of thought in this sort of vision, if you like. Um, and I think that can be assuaged if uh, we take a number of strategies. So the first is to, you laid out one of them already, um, the first is to uh, distinguish individual from group level dynamics. Uh, they don't need to be working in concert. They don't need to be helping each other. They can be working completely at odds. Uh, and that is not um, something that is difficult for us to deal with, especially in a culturally revolutionary framework. So um, I'm certainly not a proponent of the idea that culture is always adaptive um, and that it serves some fitness function. Um, that is one way to interpret culture, but there are many, many other ways. Um, in terms of uh, the distinction between conscious and unconscious choice, I um, agree with you um, that it's 
it, it kind of pushes up against, um, I, I think I think I can boil a lot of your, if I may, boil a lot of your question down to the classic um, distinction that you find between um, effectively behavioral ecology approaches and cultural evolution approaches, which is this idea that the cultural evolutionists are, are proposing that everybody's just stupid, um, um, that we're all cultural dopes, as Gar Garfinkel said. Um, Whereas the behavioral ecologists are, are, are positing this extreme agency where it's just complete knowledge of every possible uh, option and therefore the ability to integrate across all the different possibilities and choose the best possible scenario, uh, the best possible course of action in any scenario. And I, I don't think we need to, um, we don't need to dichotomize it in quite that way. And if we don't do it that way, we don't need to dichotomize it in terms of conscious versus unconscious. I personally don't think that's a very useful dichotomy. It happens to be the one that um, the one that sort of covers a lot of territory in, in this debate. But I don't personally think um, unconscious reproductive strategizing gets us very far forward um, in a way that natural fertility didn't already do. Um, so I think they're, they're overlapping ideas there. Um, and um, while I agree with you that um, the idea that there are cultural beliefs that may be sort of in the air that end up having the outcome that they influence your reproduction, um, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily want to locate all of this action in in consciousness or unconsciousness, right? I want to I want to locate it in other places. So there are other places beyond just group aggregates, which I've shown you, and individual brains um, that, uh, that where the action is going on. There are social institutions that we just accept. There are social facts about how, um, you know, what counts as a maternity ward, you know, is, is it, a maternity ward is a maternity ward independent of the individuals that make up the maternity ward. It is a, it is a social fact in and of itself. It has its own ontology. Um, and I, uh, I, I don't know, I also don't know that we need to look too closely for a very cleanly packaged um, uh, way to, to deal with this. Um, I don't think I'm going to have a really neat answer for you here because I think so much of the territory hasn't really been articulated that it may well be that there is a neater way to summarize everything than what I've come up with or, or, or a less neat way rather that uh, incorporates more dimensions but I'm really you know I think I'm, you know, one of the first people to try and really push this in, in this direction. And so um, I'm really hoping that they, over the course of this research group will, will get better at articulating all the different parts of the system. But I see reproduction effectively as a system. So we have this co-evolving system at the macro level, at the micro level. Some parts of it will be coercive in terms of power structures. Some parts of it will be agentic in terms of what individuals can do. And you raise the important issue of power, which is almost absent in a lot of this research, um, except for research that maybe looks at reproductive conflict uh, in terms of uh, the cooperative breeding model, but it doesn't necessarily talk about in terms of power structures per se. Um, and of course, we can't forget uh, many, many historical examples, not least in the United States of like forced sterilization, all sorts of negative um, uses of power in order to subjugate the reproduction of certain members of society. But it's also not true to say that women don't have agency, for example, in patriarchal societies. If I take the example in, in Vanuatu, where I have um, a long term engagement with women living under a very traditional uh, social structure, it's incredible how ingenuous they are uh, in, in, in terms of coming up with ways to navigate the system. And so I do think that people are... Um, negotiating at all times uh, the situation that they're in, and that might not be in, you know, in literal terms of reproduction. It might not be literally navigating, do I want a child now or whatever, but in the vast majority of human populations and for the vast majority of human history, um, reproduction takes up most of your life, right? It is your life. It is the life of the social group. And so it's not like these are, this is a domain that is sort of a separate topic of conversation as it is now for us. You know, we don't have to think about reproduction until we reach, I don't know, uh, college age or maybe later. Um, and then we start, you know, planning and deciding. But, you know, children at the age of five or six are engaging in childcare. They're already involved in a reproductive system. They're already involved in the cycle of, of, of the fact that the entirety of the, the, of the social milieu that they exist in um, has reproduction as its sort of animating force. 
Um, and so that's that's partly why we need this ethnog we need ethnography because we need to know more about the embeddedness of reproductive dynamics in places where we maybe wouldn't look for them, um, and in using language and terminology that we maybe wouldn't be accustomed to applying in those areas because we're so used to uh, using this kind of economistic language um, about choices and costs and benefits and um, uh, markets. So um, I think that might be a, a sort of rambling uh, attempt to uh, touch on some of the issues that you raise, all of which are really, really critical for this to succeed as a, as a, as a way to try and reframe this topic. And thank you very much for them, because I will take them, uh, you know, I took some notes and I'll, I'll keep thinking about ways to, to address them. Great, thank you so much. Um, next, we have a question from Joe Manson. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, uh, lots of stuff to think about. Um, uh, my question is about um, your, your study in Poland. And so you characterize the population as being um, ethno-religiously uniform because basically they were all Catholic. But I wonder if you collected data on religiosity, on how, you know, how religious e each woman was. Because I, I think, and I don't know this literature really at all, but I believe that some scholars have suggested that one possible uh, cultural or ideological driver of the transition to very low sub-replacement fertility, especially in parts of Europe, is the decline in, in, in religiosity. Um, first of all, to the last part of your question, you're right. Um, the problem is that everything else is also correlated with Decline to placement fertility, including time, um, and the difficulty we have at the macro level is in, is in disentangling these these bigger picture things like decline of de you know changes in de in cohabitation practices, changes in contraceptive use, changes in morality about um, reproductive control. These things are all correlated. So at the at the macro level, these things are quite difficult to disentangle. But you rightly point out the question of religiosity, so individual variation in how. Uh, religious people feel. And um, I did collect data on religiosity in Poland. And one of the results that I didn't show you, um, which comes out of the part of the research that was looking at the social clustering of contraceptive use, um, also was an, uh, uh, an, an, an analysis of the effect of religiosity at the individual level and at the community level. And there's a real, I'm glad to be able to tell you this because I, I couldn't squeeze it into the slide for want of just complete overload. But um, the, um, the effect is, the same, is, is really interesting. So if you, if you compare, there were two models. One was um, the probability of using any method of contraception versus no method. And the other one was the probability mm -hmm. of using an artificial method versus anything else. And the artificial methods in this, con in this population are very taboo. So you ask people, is it okay to use condoms and pills? And people would say no. Um, we see that in, in, the, in the safety of their network, um, the probability goes up as more people in your network use that particular measure. But what we also see um, is that the more religious other people in your community are, independent of how religious you are, that is further dampened. So I think this is very tentative. It, it's tentative because it's a small sample, but I think it's very strong evidence of conformity. Um, so what you see is that the religiosity of people in your community, independent of, of whether you're religious or not, means that you will not use the more taboo method. That effect is not found in the other model. So in the model where you're looking at any method, religiosity has no such effect, uh, which is really, really interesting because we're actually zooming in on this particularly taboo method and religiosity is definitely having um, that association. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, next we have Brooke. Hi Heidi, it was a great talk. Um, so um, I have a question, I guess, about how to move forward in integrating HPE and cultural evolution approaches. And I, I'm just I'm just curious about your thoughts. So instead of kind of throwing the baby away with the bathwater in terms of the kinds of predictors that behavioral ecologists might have traditionally used. How, um, because I still think that things like access to resources and things like that are going to be important and maybe differentially important depending on what population we're talking about, right? And so there are 
I'm trying to get a sense, I guess, of whether you are advocating for sort of an integration or like we should be moving away from this cost benefit approach and replacing it with something else. And if, if you're leaning toward a more integrative approach, what the best way to do that is. Because some of these kind of papers I've seen where they're just sort of putting these as competing predictions, like here's predictions from cultural evolution and here's predictions from HBE and let's just see which model, you know, has more strengths. To me, it seems almost counterproductive in that they're um, preventing us from seeing the interplay between all these different sort of larger cultural institutional level factors and then individual level factors and ecological context. Yeah, um, really important question. And um, under no circumstances should I be interpreted as saying we should throw one set of ideas away. Absolutely not. That's the first thing. Um, but um, I am in favour of integrating them. Um, and But integration needs to come with a sort of a framework that we can use to hang all these different insights on. So just thinking about the cost benefit approach. Um, that comes from behavioural ecology, it's, it's, it's vastly powerful um, and vastly useful. Um, and that's why it's been really, really successful and why it's connected to other fields in demography, economics. And actually, a lot of the anthropological demography really, really goes in line with these cost benefit models. So the idea, I didn't get to talk about uh, demography, uh, sorry, um, the anthropological demography that's been carried out in the Gambia, which I'm most familiar with, which is just completely fascinating because um, sub-Saharan Africa is the place par excellence where women are using modern contraceptives to strategically organize their reproduction. They're using modern contraceptives to space their births um, in ways that actually generate what look like natural fertility patterns of reproduction, but which are highly strategic and highly organized around maximizing reproduction in, 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 in the most literal sense. Um, and so um, absolutely not. I don't think that um, cost benefit approaches are incompatible with that. I think they're very compatible. I, where I think the, and I, and I agree, I don't think that trying to pull out a certain, you know, empirical predictor, which is already a proxy by proxy of some other variable and saying that one counts as cultural evolution and that one goes in the HBE box and let's see which one has the biggest effect in the model. I, I personally don't um, think that that's going to take us very far because any one of those variables can be interpreted in either way. We, they, they all, you know, the problem we have is equifinality. Our models generate the same dynamics, but at a high level of resolution such that we can't really distinguish them as causal processes. And so um, moving forward, what I think we need, you know, is to think about, yes, there are costs and benefits to reproduction. Yes, there are basic biological constraints on what's possible. Um, and this is, not, you know, my, my approach is not to deny that for a second, but what I am trying to say is, is, is to encompass it more in, um, in the cultural milieu in which those reproductive costs and benefits exist and in which the opportunity costs um, are constrained by the interactions that you have, by the values that you have, by the power dynamics that exist and by uh, the opportunities you have to learn about uh, things from, from outside, for example. And so, you know, the, the whole study on education um, was exactly this idea. So the idea was, let's take a variable that is considered to be the most important predictor of fertility decline, edu women's education. Uh, a variable that is constantly instantiated as, you know, in the, in the individual woman and changing her um, somehow in a way that makes her want to have fewer children. And let's imagine that that's not just an economic proxy. And let's think about that as a cultural, um, as a cultural variable. Why not? Because education is also a proxy for endless numbers of other things that are to do with information transmission, exposure to the wider world, um, all sorts of things. Um, but we, our bias is to consider it as, as a proxy of wealth, for example. Um, and the whole point of, um, taking this one variable and splitting it into community and individual level effects um, was to show that um, basically any predictor can probably be decomposed in this way and to help us highlight um, dynamics that are happening. It's not that there's one, you know, it's not this approach of like certain sets of predictors for certain sets of theories, because I just don't think we're going to we're going to manage that really well because it's just so difficult. I think um, what we need to do is analyze them in ways that are taking into account the possibility of dynamics at different levels of analysis. Um, 
and um, you know, costs and benefits have to be learned. They don't, you know, these are not deus ex machina situations, right? You, you have to learn that it's costly to reproduce from somewhere and you can't see everything and you can't know everything. And you, you know, your first reproduction is an event that happens once in your life. Um, it's not something that you, you get to do again and again and, and, and engage in trial and error learning on, you know, it's a highly uncertain and highly um, unpredictable event. And so it, it, it would seem just totally, you know, putting one arm behind your back to, to, to just deny that there's, there's lots of information in the environment, whether it's uh, from your mother or from your family or from your friends or from your colleagues or whatever. So yeah, so I don't, uh, moving forward, um, I think that um, this is an integrative approach. Um, the integration I think will come as we expand, um, you know, the baseline of what's been done, um, which is very significant in evolutionary anthropology into a more ethnographically informed um, conversation. And the great thing about that is that behavioral ecologists are the biggest ethnographers in the discipline, if you like. Uh, they're the ones who are most engaged in long-term fieldwork and the real challenges of trying to quantify people's social life and in trying to deal with, you know, emic and etic categories. And I think we just need to let people, um, you know, the, the sociology of the field has been such that um, there's been so much energy spent on trying to uh, make human behavioral ecology a respectable quantitative field of inquiry that I think the field did throw the baby out with the bathwater a little bit. Not, um, not now, I think it's happened already. I think we need to bring it back in because you look at these classic um, behavioral ecology papers and they're, they're rich with ethnographic detail. And some behavioral ecologists still do that. And, and, and part of the reason why we don't do it more than we should is because we don't have venues for that kind of writing. Um, the way that we've structured our, our publication strategies is such that we're focused on scientific publications. Nobody writes monographs anymore. Um, we don't have many venues for um, the publication of qualitative research. And I mean, I could go on for another hour about the valorization of quantitative data and, you know, you'd be bored to tears, but um, that's a whole other story. But yeah, I mean, I'm fully on board with, I, I don't see any reason to throw anything away. We just need to bring them together and try and, um, you know, oil the joints a bit better. Thank you for that. Uh, so we will draw to a close pretty soon, but before that, we have two more questions in the queue. Uh, we have Sally and then Andrew. Um, hi, yeah, th thank you for your talk. I just had a question about um, the last, like one of the things towards the end about the density of the kin networks and how they, um, it decreased with market integration. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, why that happened or if you have any insight, yeah, about that more. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, so, I mean, the law, so this is, let's gloss this as the loss of kin. Um, and this is a really, really deep question that has concerned sociologists and anthropologists for, you know, hundreds of years. The idea um, of the transition from, um, uh, the German comes from um, Tonnies, who was um, a German sociologist who made this distinction between Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. So Gemeinschaft is basically this idea of community and Gesellschaft is this idea of society. And so it's this really old idea in sociology about um, what happens when, when you transition between those two forms of, of social living. And one of the major um, conduits of that transition is um, the breakdown of traditional kin interactions. So this is a really old question. I am certainly not the first to try and, and pose it. Um, and the sociology literature talks about um, the difference between the loss of kin, the liberation from kin, um, and um, the gaining of kin in some instances uh, in terms of different kinds of interactions, both in urban contexts where people are moving from rural to urban, but also in terms of uh, these sort of old, um, medieval models of what a, what a peasant community looked like. So you have this community where um, the social world is, is, is dense with kin, 
um, the values are um, kin based values. Um, and then what happens is in the course of market integration, you stop doing everything at home, basically. So you start having this division between where you work and where you are, where you engage in your domestic activities. And that division starts this whole process. And then you get this increasing fragmentation of social interaction. But there's a really nice um, uh, sort of cultural evolutionary take on this by um, Leslie Newson um, and Pete Richardson. Um, which is the idea that, um, so this is a bit more sort of formalized in an evolutionary way. So the, the idea is that kin interactions, because we're cooperative breeders, right? Um, so most of our human history has been spent interacting with kin. And I mean, this is also not necessarily true, I should say. Um, there's a lot of pushback against the idea that humans evolved only in kin-based societies. And there's plenty of evidence that hunter-gatherers, uh, you know, 50% of the social network is non-kin. But leaving that aside for the moment, this general idea that um, kin interactions um, partly are there to support you, partly are there, you know, in the process they're um, uh, affecting your fertility through um, the fact that um, if you're, you know, if you're interacting with your kin, there's fitness benefits to be had in terms of inclusive fitness. Um, so the idea is that kin members will sort of naturally have an inclination to be pronatal with other kin members. Um, whatever that means in any specific instance, it means that you would maybe communicate with your kin in a way that's um, more consistent with encouraging uh, reproduction compared to when you communicate with your non-kin, maybe it's just not a topic of conversation or much going from that to much more overt, you know, mother-in-law is pressuring me to have children kind of scenarios. Um, and the idea is that simply, uh, you know, very subtle differences in the frequency of those interactions um, will over time chip away at that edifice. And so, slowly you're, introdu you're introducing non-kin into the mix, non-kin have no interest in your reproduction. Um, this is the idea. Um, and slowly, slowly you sort of chip away at this edifice of, uh, of kinship that rules. Um, and you no longer have your family organizing your marriages, you no longer have your family uh, living in your house with you and supporting you in child rearing. Um, and and this, it's basically this gradual process of, of, of loss of kin. And, I don't know that we have um, a very good handle on that beyond that kind of theoretical idea, but there's presumably lots and lots of different components to it. And so this kin, this kin density um, thing was an attempt to start to actually just first of all, see if that's even happening, because um, there has been a little bit of research looking at um, the number of kin that people interact with, um, but it's not at this fine grained level uh, of detail. And so that's the unique um, contribution that this kind of data collection um, can can bring because you just don't get that level of detail in uh, in you know national nationally representative surveys. So um, I think that's as much as I can answer for now. <laughs> that's great. Thanks. Okay, let's um, let's have one more question from Andrew before we conclude. Uh, hi, thank you for a great talk. My question is actually um, sort of involved and poorly um, articulated in my head at this point. So as long as I can send you a quick email about it uh, later on, I'm happy to like pass the baton on this one for the moment. Sure. I'm happy to have emails. Great. But okay. I, but I made everybody curious what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Andrew, you're welcome to ask if you'd like, but if you would rather wait till later, we can. Uh, I, I mean, it was basically about the evolvability of norms that favor sort of targets of, you know, economic output that preclude, um, you know, fertility options, um, but it's not especially well articulated a question. Well, let me try and give you an inarticulate answer. Um, so um, that's a cool question because um, that's actually a question that nobody has asked as far as I know. And I would love somebody to um, develop a research project on this because this is precisely a kind of a fallback argument that tends to happen when you, um, if you challenge um, people who are committed to the notion um, that, uh, you know, for most of human history, uh, we didn't need reproductive psychology. We don't need a reproductive psychology. We don't need a target 
um, for selection because we didn't need it because for most of human history, you children themselves were the marker of wealth or wealth itself was some other embodied feature. Um, and um, I think that's a really interesting argument. Um, and, you know, it goes hand in hand with the idea that uh, that would explain why we have this cascade towards low fertility on a global scale, because there is no target yet. Um, for selection. And that leads to the argument that that target is now forming. And so we should expect natural selection in the future to, you know, um, select for individuals who, for whatever reason, have preferences for high fertility, whether that's religious preferences or other kinds of, um, you know, categorizations that we want to make about people. Um, and that they'll just quickly outreproduce those um, people who, who don't want to have high fertility. And that's, is this kind of the direction you're going in? Um, so, so there are some models um, taking on this particular question in the cultural evolutionary literature, and I didn't have time to show them to you, but there are a couple of models that are really, really interesting um, that look at basically the arms race between natural selection on high fertility and um, horizontal transmission uh, versus vertical transmission of cultural preferences to do with family size. And um, if you email me, I can send you the, the papers, but the, the general gist is that um, if people are not clones of their parents in terms of what their reproductive preferences are, and I doubt anybody in this Zoom chat has exactly the reproductive preferences of their parents, um, I'd be surprised if they did. I mean, certainly my father came from a family of 12 and I have no intention of, of, of or ability, my costs uh, are, are too high. Um, but um, if you allow individuals to innovate their reproductive preferences and that innovation is allowed to come from some horizontal source of information, um, natural selection uh, can be held at bay over the long term. So there are a number of models that are, are, are sort of going in this direction. But more generally, your question is really important because um, it's, it's an evolutionary question. It's a question that we need um, to uh, you know, operationalize uh, in a formal way and to look at the long-term trajectories because it's just the kind of thing that could throw up really counterintuitive um, dynamics. But thanks. Great. I'm glad that uh, you were able to ask that question and Heidi, that you were able to answer that um, super interesting topic. Um, and with that, I think that uh, we to draw to a close. Um, I want to thank you again, Heidi, for a great talk and for a great question and answer session. If anyone would like to unmute yourselves, please feel free so we can thank Heidi for her, for her talk. I just want to say thank you so much again for, for having me and for bearing with me with the, the technical issues at the beginning there. Um, and it's really nice to see faces and, and boxes and people listening and enjoying this talk. So I'm, I'm really, really delighted. Thanks very much. Great, thanks. It's 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 great, and I appreciate your um, willingness to visit us at such a late hour where you are. So, um, thanks so much, and uh, I will see you all later next week for Nadia Vasilyeva's. Take care, everyone. Mm -hmm.